Hi, I'm Grant, and I'll be talking about classifying memory access patterns for prefetching. Caches help CPUs perform well in nearly all of our devices, from small wearables all the way up to the data center. However, the increasing demands of all of our services, features, and data are outpacing the ability of our hardware to keep up. If we look at this at data center scales like at Google, we find that up to 75% of CPU performance potential is lost to stalls, the majority of which come from instruction and data cache misses. If we could eliminate these cache misses, CPUs would easily be more than twice as performant, meaning we could build half as many general purpose data centers for the same performance we have today. So what can we do to reduce cache misses? Well, the two most common approaches are to increase cache capacity and to use prefetching. But both of these approaches have challenges. First of all, on-chip area is already heavily utilized for caching, sometimes taking up as much space as the computational cores themselves. So there really isn't a lot of room to squeeze much more on there in the first place. Furthermore, caching often gives diminishing returns in performance when we add modest amounts of capacity. And the reason for this is that many workloads exhibit very little reuse or have working set sizes that are so large that they're never gonna fit in the cache in the first place. On the other hand, prefetching can be cheaper to implement, but the problem is that we don't have a one size fits all prefetcher that is both easy to build and which is very performant for a wide range of memory access patterns. Instead, what we have is a potpourri of prefetcher proposals, which are each effective under very specific conditions, but ultimately aren't found in real world devices. To help illustrate this, on the right hand side, we have a word cloud of the titles of the prefetcher proposals that we reference in our paper. And hopefully this gives a rough sense of the quantity and diversity of the work that has gone into this area. Here's another way that we can visualize the landscape of data prefetchers. Here we have several hardware and software based data prefetcher families, where the x axis is the implementation burden or cost, and the y axis is the product of performance and generality. So an ideal prefetcher would be in the top left, where it's really cheap to build, and it also performs really well for a wide range of memory access patterns. An ideal prefetcher doesn't exist today. On the left, in the green area, we have several simple prefetchers that are able to fetch the next line or detect simple patterns like strides. These are easy enough to build that we find them in most of our devices today, but they're unable to detect and prefetch more complex patterns. On the right side, in the red area, we have prefetchers that memorize and replay the access stream, or which pre-compute the access stream using an additional hardware thread or processor. These prefetchers are extremely expensive in terms of storage and complexity, and so they're typically not found in real devices. Well, prefetching becomes increasingly difficult as we try and capture more and more complex patterns. And one thing that all of these designs have in common is that they don't actually understand the underlying program behavior. So the key to better and cheaper prefetching is to first understand what these underlying access patterns are. Specifically, the key questions that we want to answer in this work are the following. First, what are the memory access patterns of these programs? Building upon this, how many of these patterns do current prefetchers actually recognize? And what are the patterns that they don't recognize? Second, is there enough time to pre-compute these patterns for prefetching? In other words, can we prefetch fast enough that it will actually work? So how do we go about doing this? The typical way to find memory access patterns is to analyze address traces from programs. Here we have an example address trace where a prefetcher may be able to pick out sequential accesses for a next line prefetcher and some strides. But what about everything else? Well, we can add some additional information such as the instruction address or program counter. And this helps us to differentiate patterns that may have been hidden by instruction interleaving. However, it's still unclear how we could detect and prefetch any patterns that are not spatially correlated, such as linked list and pointer based traversals, because these will look random in the address trace. Even if we throw a heavy hammer like machine learning at this to do the work for us, we can't expect with these features at least anything better than spatial or memorization based prefetching. This gets even more challenging in practice. When we consider other system effects like cache filtering, reordering from out of order processors, and thread interleaving, it can quickly become difficult to find even these simple spatial patterns. Here's another idea. Programs compute every single one of their memory addresses, so why don't we look inside the program itself to find the access patterns? By doing this, we can not only find stride and other spatial patterns like before, 
but we can also discover new types of locality, such as pointer-based traversals and reference locality, which looks like random noise in the address trace. Putting it all together, we need to better understand memory access patterns in order to make improved prefetchers. There's only so much we can hope to learn from simple address traces, but by shifting paradigms to direct program analysis, we have much more complete information to help guide us. The goal of our work is to understand and classify memory access patterns of applications so that we can answer those key questions. And we do this with program data flow analysis. Next, I'll talk about our data flow methodology, then use it to characterize a set of small and warehouse scale workloads. And finally, we'll put it all together with a data flow informed prefetching evaluation. The overall data flow analysis procedure is the following. First, we locate important misses in the program execution stream. This means identifying important instructions, or miss PCs, based on how many cache misses they cause. We can find this information in a number of ways, including with hardware performance counters or cache modeling with traces. Next, for each of these important miss PCs, we extract all of the instructions that contributed to forming the address that was presented to the memory system and ultimately caused a cache miss. This might be as simple as a single constant fixed value or as complicated as millions of instructions and operations. In any case, we can represent these address calculations as data flow graphs of operations and operands. Next, we take these data flow graphs and reduce them to their most compact forms. This step is critical because things such as stack operations, loop iterations, and register spilling can create overly large and complex data flow graphs that mask much simpler underlying behaviors. We'll see an example of this in a moment. Finally, with a fully reduced data flow graph, we can classify its underlying fundamental formula and reason about its behavior. One thing that's nice about doing this at the instruction level instead of, say, higher up at a source code level is that we have complete generality to analyze anything that can run on the system. We implemented our data flow methodology in a tool which has three inputs, the program binary, a miss profile, and a control flow profile. The output of our tool is a set of data flow kernels, which represent the reduced graphs from earlier. It also contains a lot of meta information about the size and complexity of these kernels and how fast they can run relative to the main program. Our initial implementation took about 20,000 lines of code, with a majority of the footprint being devoted to graph reductions. So let's take a look at why graph reduction is so important with a small example. Here, we're looking at a hot section of libquantum, which is part of the spec CPU 2006 benchmark suite. Libquantum has a very simple stride access pattern where it runs through a loop incrementing a load address each time by 16 bytes. The x86 instructions representing this loop are on the right hand side. By following the data dependencies, starting with the load miss near the bottom of the code, we can build the data flow graph shown at the left. But it's a bit surprising since this looks really complicated for just adding 16 to an address. In particular, we have three additions and an extra load operation. So how do we take something like this and determine that it's actually a stride access pattern? There are two reduction opportunities here. First, a copy from one register to another can be bypassed since there's no computation. We see this with the assignment of register RDX to RSI. Second, we need to understand if and how source operands in the graph change from one execution to the next. In this case, register RBX combines with a constant to form an address that is loaded at each iteration. However, register RBX is not ever modified in this graph. So in this context, it's constant. What that means is that the load address that it forms is also constant, and the data that is loaded into the temp register is constant as well, since there's no memory store to that location. Well, it turns out that this is the base address for the array, and intuitively it makes sense that the base address would not change between the iterations. Having fully reduced the graph, we can now classify it. In this case, the constants collapse and we are left with a recurrence relation. The address at time n is the address at time n minus one, plus a constant, in this case 16. In other words, this is a stride access pattern. Now, if we were evaluating a stride prefetcher here, we can now expect with confidence that it should be able to handle this location. On the other hand, if this pattern had been more complex, then we can expect with confidence that the stride prefetcher would not be able to succeed in this location. Either way, we can now view in each misinstruction in terms of the prefetcher capabilities that would be required 
in order to compute the next address. There are many other reduction steps that can help us see the underlying patterns. One example is distribution, where, for example, we might find that a register is constant because it changes by a net sum of zero in the data flow graph. The key thing to remember here is that while these reduction steps can be complicated, they are necessary to avoid pessimistically classifying misaddresses as overly complex. In our tests, the average graph compaction factor ranged from 1.3x for small workloads to 40x for large complex workloads. The maximum compression ratio can be as high as millions. Now let's move to the workload evaluation section. We analyzed eight workloads which we found to represent a wide range of memory pattern complexity. LibQuantum and OmnetPP are from Spec CPU 2006. CNIL or CNIL is from Parsec. Then we have XSBench, XHPCG, and three warehouse scale workloads from Google Web Search, Knowledge Graph, and an ads backend. These plots show the types of computations that are required to directly compute a given percentage of misses in each workload. For example, LibQuantum on the top left only requires addition to compute memory addresses. And this makes sense for a stride based access pattern like we saw in our prior analysis. In other words, a, a prefetcher with only a simple adder would be sufficient for libquantum. Further to the right, 97% of the MIS addresses in CNIL are computed with addition and a load operation. What this means is that we need to load data from memory as part of the address computation itself. Now, this type of behavior is extremely common when following pointers or pointer based data structures. But you can't rely on a stride or spatial based prefetcher to do this because every address may look completely random compared to its prior. Other workloads require shifts, bitwise operations like AND or NOT, and multiplication. These are easy to compute in a CPU, but a hardware based prefetcher that can't simply memorize the access stream must be able to support some of these operations in order to be effective. One clear takeaway is that the MIS addresses in large scale workloads have diverse and complex computation requirements. And as such, we can only expect a stride prefetcher to handle fewer than 30% of the misses for each of the Google workloads. However, at the same time, these large workloads also have a significant portion of MIS addresses which are entirely constant. Constant addresses are fully predictable. And so this hints to us that they aren't used frequently enough to remain resident in the caches, most likely due to the large working set sizes of these workloads. This is an immediate prefetching opportunity that could be implemented, for example, in software using profile guided optimization. Another takeaway is that even complicated data center workloads require only a relatively small set of operations to compute a majority of their MIS addresses, namely addition, multiplication, bitwise operations, and loads. This means that if we were to build a hardware prefetcher to capture more of these classes, it wouldn't need to be a full general purpose processor, but could instead be specialized to handle these specific operations. We're now able to answer our first key question. What are the memory access patterns of programs? Data flow analysis gives us the formulas for computing each MIS address, and from that we can categorize the behavior. With this knowledge, we can see why stride prefetchers, which are common in all of our chips, are not adequate. And more generally, we can calculate how much any given prefetcher can help any given workload. Finally, we can extend this to designing improved prefetching techniques that cover a higher percentage of misses. But what about our second question, which deals with timeliness? Is knowing what to prefetch good enough? A successful prefetch request needs to bring data in soon enough that it can be a cache hit, but not so soon that it's evicted from the cache before the program actually needs it. In other words, there is a window of time in which a prefetch request must complete in order for it to work. So let's assume that we had a prefetcher that took full advantage of the pattern information from Dataflow. Such a prefetcher would have nearly 100% accuracy and coverage since it can directly calculate all the addresses. Would such a prefetcher maximize performance? What if we had really long prefetch kernels or really tight loops without a lot of time to run ahead? Well, a second capability of data flow based analysis is that it allows us to study timeliness independently from accuracy. We can do this by leveraging our information about program and data flow kernel sizes to model how quickly we can run ahead with these direct calculations. Let's take a look at two examples. Here we're looking at a timing plot for CNIL. The purpose of this plot is to show how likely a program is to be able to prefetch in time. The X axis is the latency of the reduced data flow kernels, which can be used for address calculations. The Y axis is the latency of the original program between occurrences of the same misinstruction. 
Each point is a data flow kernel colored by its relative importance. The blue line is a slope of 1, which is the slowest that any prefetch kernel can be relative to the machine. In other words, any points along the blue line represent addresses that cannot be computed faster than the program consumes them. An example of this would be a pure pointer chase. So points up high are really easy to compute in time, and there are a lot of them here, but at least in this case, they're not extremely important. The darker points are more important and still look faster than the machine, so it's possible that they could be prefetched in time. In particular, if we look at the most important point, we have a 3x advantage, meaning that we can compute the next three addresses before the program needs one of them. And this is because the program is doing other work. So it looks like there's an opportunity here, and we can check this with our full coverage straw man prefetcher. The figure on the right shows the speed up of CNIL when using a stride prefetcher and various configurations of a data flow informed prefetcher, where the blue bar near the right represents a data flow prefetcher that enables the load operation. Recall that nearly all of the MIS addresses in CNIL require addition and memory loads. Because of this indirection, there is no performance gain for the stride prefetcher or the configurations of our data flow prefetcher that do not support memory loads. On the other hand, allowing load-based address computation speeds the program up significantly, though not quite to the maximum theoretical amount. And this is caused primarily by the less timely kernels near the blue line, as well as filtering out part of the tail of lower impact misses. Nevertheless, the performance improvement is substantial. Now let's move this into the data center for a final example. Now we are looking at web search, which has an enormous instruction and data footprint. The good news is that a vast majority of misses are high above the blue line, which means that we have enough slack to prefetch them in time. On the other hand, many misses are near the blue line, including the most important kernels. It will be inherently difficult to prefetch these in time. Looking at performance on the right, we see that the stride and loadless data flow prefetchers do offer some improvement since web search has many kernels which are constant or require only addition. The best performance comes from a load enabled data flow prefetcher, although the benefit is also attenuated by the long tail and non-timely kernels. The major takeaway here is that high accuracy is not sufficient. We must also be cognizant of timing as a primary constraint. Thus, looking forward, Better prefetcher design will not only involve understanding more complex access patterns, but also techniques to ensure or improve timeliness where it is critical. This is the frontier of data prefetching, and fortunately, data flow analysis allows us to separate the study of accuracy and timeliness for each miss in the program. Revisiting our second key question, is there enough time to pre-compute patterns for prefetching? The answer is yes for many programs and kernels. For others, ensuring timeliness will be a first-order challenge. In conclusion, better prefetching requires a deeper understanding of memory behavior. Data flow analysis gives this to us by fully describing memory accesses. It tells us what to prefetch as well as when to prefetch or how much timing slack is available. Now we better understand why some workloads and patterns are inherently hard to prefetch. Also, we can bound the expected benefits of existing prefetchers and design more capable prefetchers looking forward. Please see our paper for more details, and thanks for watching.